Bed Bath & Beyond is a big box retail store specializing in the sale of bed and bath products, but it does go beyond that, it's a fitting name. Look, I think that most of us have at least some experience with this store, considering that they are the biggest of their kind to ever exist. In terms of size, they peaked in 2018, with over 1,500 locations across the United States that were generating sales of over $12 billion a year, making them a Fortune 500 company. I know I can't be the only one that always thinks of the movie Click with Adam Sandler, the store's in a couple of memorable scenes. That movie, by the way, was released in 2006 when the chain was obviously already huge, but still not even half of the size that it would eventually become. In fact, there was a point, maybe about a decade ago, where Bed Bath & Beyond was widely considered to be among the most impressive retail success stories, which is why it's so depressing that I'm making this video. They have not been doing well for many years now. There have been times where they make some promising changes that do show little signs of hope here and there, but overall, it has not been good. In 2014, Bed Bath & Beyond had a market value of $17 billion that has since fallen to well under half a billion as of the making of this video. There have been multiple announcements of store closings over the past few years, the most recent one saying that 87 more of them are shutting down. In September of 2022, sadly, their CFO took his own life, who was specifically brought in as part of a team to help turn things around for them. The following month, Moody's downgraded their credit rating due to a high likelihood of a default over the next 12 months, there has been extensive bankruptcy talk stemming from official statements made by the company, essentially saying that they can't really afford to pay their debts. Their sales graph over the past few years is not what you want to see. Yeah, they've been mostly just circling down the drain for multiple years now, and I hate to say it, but unless something big happens, it's looking like Bed Bath & Beyond may potentially be gone soon. This is a big deal, and something that I very much want to cover, so in this video, I'm going to talk about the eventful rise and and fall of Bed Bath & Beyond. Leonard Feinstein and Warren Eisenberg were two managers at a failing department store called Arlands. In 1971, they reported $19 million in losses and would soon file for bankruptcy. So that year, the two of them quit their jobs to start their own business. Based on their experience, they felt that department stores were on their way out and specialty stores were the way of the future. It motivated them to open a store that only sold bed and bath products, appropriately called Bed in Bath. It was nothing fancy, just a 2,000 square foot location that was part of a strip mall in New Jersey, but it was a start, and it turns out that they were right about the potential of specialty stores. By 1985, it had grown to 17 locations, mostly still in the Northeast, but by this time, there was quite a bit of competition emerging. Most notably, Linens and Things was a similar store that had recently been acquired by a large company called Melville. They were the owners of multiple retail chains, including KB Toys and CVS, so they they had the resources to expand Linens and Things to more than 50 locations. In an attempt to separate themselves from Linens and Things and the other growing competition, Bed and Bath decided to start opening these 20,000 plus square foot superstores and they changed their name to Bed Bath and Beyond. All of that is leading me to my first reason behind their initial success, Variety. See, the idea to open these superstores was not an original one. It was heavily influenced by a trend that was happening in retail at the time, where a specialty store would scale their operations by opening large locations that were cost efficient enough to offer the customer an incredible variety of products at low enough prices. All becoming huge throughout the 1980s and 1990s to a point where this type of a store became commonly known as a category killer. Such an aggressive name, but it was appropriate because they were putting many of the smaller stores out of business. In the case of Bed Bath & Beyond, they were selling bed and bath products in just about every form imaginable. Seriously, if you were looking for a towel in a specific shape or size or color, you would likely find it there. And I know that doesn't sound all that impressive today, but 30 plus years ago, that was unbelievable. The company was also really successful with their marketing. Very little money was ever spent on advertising. You would hardly ever see a commercial for them. They would instead put that money toward their service or the in-store experience in some way and trust that the customers would have a pleasant enough time to want to tell other people about it. Also, the coupons. They eventually became known for their blue and white coupons coupons that would give the customer 20% off their purchase. The founders felt that traditional sales or promotions would restrict the customer to certain items, while these coupons allowed them to get a deal on whatever they wanted. They would send out hundreds of millions of these each year through the mail, and they would be effective in attracting customers into the stores. Alright, I'm gonna start moving quicker through some of these. The layout has 
always been important. Specifically, their really tall displays, stacking merchandise, sometimes all the way up to the ceiling. It allows the customer to see the different sections from far away. They are big stores after all, but it also helps show the sheer volume and variety of their inventory. Another factor was their decentralized approach as far as inventory and management, saving money by having everything delivered directly to the stores instead of storing it in a central warehouse, and allowing each store to make adjustments based on their own specific markets. They allowed the managers to use their own judgment of the area to make adjustments to the prices or even the product selection. Finally, for this list, you have to respect the fact that for many years, Bed Bath & Beyond expanded their operations organically, reinvesting their profits to open new stores without relying on any major acquisitions. What I mean by that is they didn't buy any other companies until 2002, and even then, they were all on a comparatively small scale. That first acquisition was for Harmon, a chain of 27 stores. The following year, they bought a 23-store chain called Christmas Tree Shops. In 2007, they bought Bye Bye Baby, which sounds like it might have been a big one, given they have over 100 locations today, but there were only eight of them when they bought it, and I should mention that it was started by two sons of co-founder Leonard Feinstein, who was still with the company, so a bit of a family connection there. In 2012, they made their biggest acquisition, when they paid almost $500 million for 250 locations of Cost Plus World Market, though I still argue they did very little to impact their core operations and was mostly more of a side project. So given all these factors, I think it makes sense how Bed Bath & Beyond was able to grow into the multi-billion dollar Fortune 500 company that they became. But clearly, things took a negative turn from there. So now, this video is going to turn much more depressing as I identify what I believe to be three of the biggest reasons behind their decline. All three of these have been incredibly harmful, but the root of the trouble started with competition. Remember, in the 1980s into the 1990s, Bed Bath & Beyond became a category killer by offering an unbeatable variety at reasonable prices. Well, as it turns out, most of the companies using that model, competing based on variety, have been especially vulnerable to e-commerce. Obviously, Amazon and other internet retailers have been able to beat that level of variety, and in a more convenient way. So it's not just Bed Bath & Beyond. Almost all of the category killers that grew to dominate their market back then have been forced to either readjust their strategy or shut down altogether. I realize I'm probably just stating the obvious here, but Bed Bath & Beyond probably should have made a heavy investment in e-commerce many years ago, but that is not what they did. As recent as 2012, their website only accounted for 3% of their total sales. They did try to improve on that by acquiring multiple internet retailers, but again, it was on a comparatively small scale, and none of them did all that much to have an impact on the core operations. So now, their excessive in-store selection quickly turned into a bad thing. It was no longer luring in the customers in the same way it once did. It even became overwhelming to many of them, but they were still paying to maintain it. They had to resort to other means to attract customers, and for that, they relied more heavily on their famous coupon promotions. Really, it seemed like everyone who was there was only there to utilize their 20% off coupons, which is a way to maintain customers and continue turning over inventory, but it's in a less profitable way. I find it interesting that from 2013 to 2018, a six-year span, their sales continued rising while their profits consistently fell. So even though 2018 was technically their biggest year, it's hard to deny that major troubles were already starting years before that. My second reason behind the decline is their failed turnaround plan. Now, it's a little tricky, but in 2019, some investors didn't approve of how the company was being handled. Honestly, it seems like they may have had a point. So they pressured the CEO to step down, which also led to both founders resigning from the board of directors. In short, it was a complete shakeup that brought in a bunch of new people to run things. Notably, Mark Tritton became the new CEO. He had previously been the chief of merchandising over at Target, where he led some effective strategies that involved introducing private label brands. Those are the store brands that tend to have much higher margins compared to the national ones that are more well known. His plan for Bed Bath & Beyond was to essentially introduce eight or nine private labels to be sold exclusively in their stores, sell off most of those unrelated companies that they had acquired, and reinvest that money into the core operations for things like remodeling stores and technology advancements, and finally reduce the reliance on coupons, which I have to admit sounds like a perfect plan that could potentially solve all of their issues. Just think about that. Store brands are more profitable, and they give the customer a reason to shop at your store over other internet retailers like Amazon or Wayfair because they can't be found over there. It all seemed very promising, but 
it didn't work. Mostly because they were impatient. Right away, they took many of the name brands off the shelves and replaced them with the new store brands that no one had ever heard of before. They should have slowly introduced them, giving the customer time to get to know them and compare them to the ones that they already know. Plus, the pandemic happened right in the middle of all of this, leading to unexpected supply chain issues. In the end, the plan made things even worse. I mean, this is where their profits really started to struggle. In 2022, they got rid of Mark Tritton, discontinued many of the store brands, reintroduced many of the name brands that the customers had been missing, and started distributing more coupons again. Essentially taking a step back in many ways from the turnaround plan, but it's not like that was a great place to be stepping back to anyway. There's so much more that could be said about this, but that's the main idea. My final reason behind the decline is stock buybacks. A company may buy back their own stock if they feel it's undervalued or as an effort to reduce outstanding shares and manipulate the price of it. Well, Bed Bath & Beyond has been buying their own shares off the stock market fairly consistently for almost 20 years now. Notably, in 2014, they issued $1.5 billion of bonds and used that money to buy back their own stock. This is where most of their debt came from. They were completely debt-free before that. Knowing what we all know now, I can assure you that borrowing money to buy Bed Bath & Beyond stock in 2014 was a bad decision. They also spent an additional billion dollars buying it back during that big turnaround plan. That showed confidence, but clearly turned out to be another waste of money. Over those past 20 years, they actually spent almost $12 billion to buy back their own stock at an average price of $44 per share, whereas right now it's trading in single digits. If they hadn't done all this, bankruptcy wouldn't even be in the question because they wouldn't be in debt and they would have a lot of money to try to make changes and execute yet another turnaround plan. Let me know in the comments, what do you think of Bed Bath & Beyond? Do you go there regularly or only when you have a coupon or do you avoid them altogether because you prefer one of their competitors? Either way, if you're interested in Bed Bath & Beyond in any way, I recommend you play it safe and take a trip over there soon because it's unclear how long they're going to be there. Also, what do you see for their future? Is it too late? Will there be a revival? And any other thoughts you have about Bed Bath & Beyond, leave them in the comments. I'd like to hear what you have to say. Thank you for watching.